These are FIO's FH7 flagship hybrid IEMs. Behind me are some other flagships. We have Focal's Utopias and Mezes Empyreans. But what have these flagship headphones, which are over $3,000, got to do with these flagship IEMs, which are under $500? We'll watch on to find out. FH7s have been long anticipated as they are the first FIO IEMs with changeable nozzles, not just changeable tips. So indeed these do have changeable nozzles, but you know, things aren't quite what they seem as it turns out. They also have a new cable and uh, we, if you see compared to F the FH5 cable, well it looks shinier for one, it's got a, a different weave compared to the FH5 cable and uh, supposedly is a, a bit better quality. They also have a pure silver cable, which I have here, which I'll talk about a bit later. But they've uh, gone one up on the FH5. If we go and have a bit of a, a, a uh, review of the FH5, which I have a video about entirely, if you haven't already seen it. It's their first uh, high, more moderate high-end hybrid IEM. And uh, you can see here I've removed the grills here, which I talked about in the video, but uh, this used uh, a, a uh, dynamic driver and balanced armature drivers. But they've upped the technology they've used in the FH7s where they have a uh, more complex internal structure inside the FH7s for guiding the sound. And this is made for uh, some interesting changes. Now, when we talk, and also sort of very stiff cables and stiff plugs, but when we talked about the FH5s, they were very sensitive to, uh, very sensitive to the effect of the tips. So if you use narrowbore tips on, uh, like these uh, standard tips you get uh, with the uh, FH5s and FH7s, it would give you more bass, whereas if you used like a, you had different tips, this is the FH7 set, but it's similar to the FH5 set, except there's no, there are no uh, kind of spin fits in the, uh, the FH5 set. And uh, I don't think there were biflange either, but the, you, could, you had vocal tips and you had bass tips and you could kind of, it would adjust the sound slightly with the FH5s, you get a bit more uh, a bass with the bass tips and a bit more of a vocal focus, and they already were quite vocal focused. Well, they had kind of the, the big thundering bass, and uh, you know, treble was about spot on. Although, of course, not not high, super high end treble quality, still pretty good, and, and but otherwise a pretty clean delivery. Now, with the FH sevens, and probably worth taking a look at the the slightly different design here. They're mostly fairly similar in in design. I'll just hold them up as close as I can to the camera. I've got some good pictures of them side by side. The FH7 probably may go just kind of, it's hard to see here, it may go just a little bit deeper. It's only by a millimeter deeper, say, than the FH5 in terms of the extension of the nozzle. And it seems like the nozzle is a little bit narrower, but it's a little bit, it doesn't have quite that, that notch on here, which may getting tips on somewhat difficult, but actually it is the same diameter apart from that notch. So design-wise, and of course this sticks out, the, uh, the plug socket sticks out a little bit more, I guess, to give them more room inside. They're not radically different in terms of overall design, except, you know, the wave style is a little bit more fancy on the FH7s. And I'll tell you what, to see how much more fancy, the how much, I suppose, better the wave design is in these FH7s versus the FH5, well, the sound quality too is about that much better. That's actually a good analogy. So in terms of material it's looking kind of nicer, it's about the same kind of jump up. But let's take a closer look at this because the nozzles are interesting. Now, I've had IEMs in here before from Talk Audio, although I didn't review them, which had nozzles with a different shape inside that would distinctly alter the uh, sound profile. And much like you get with tips, you know, if you have a narrower bore or whatever, they had different shaped bores to, to change the sound as necessary. And there are some other IEMs that use this trick as well. The FH7 uh, filters or nozzles or whatever uh, come in this little cool pill-like screwing container, which is super easy to lose. And I've got the, the base-focused ones here, which are red. The standard ones are black, and there are some treble ones which are green, or it could be around the wrong way. But... If we have a close look, it looked like we've got a bore shape change here. So let me just focus in here. You can see that the treble shape ones, oh, the treble is green, I was correct, are straight pass through, whereas it looks like you've got a narrower bore with the standard and actually the base ones look much the same. But actually this is not true. 
if you see around the central bore, they are actually passing through the sound. And why is the central bore slightly different? Well, let's take apart the IMs themselves. If we unscrew the nozzle and try not to drop it, we have the base one it looks much almost identical to the standard ones, except it's got a the central part, the filter's different. If you can see there, it's slightly got a slightly different amount of filtering in the center. And that's because if we look at the IEM itself, what do we see in the center? A set of balanced armatures, the nozzle, the exiting, the exit nozzle or the sound tube or whatever of the set of balanced armatures in the middle for the treble. So actually all the sound from the other balanced armatures and for the mid-range and the bass driver pass through around it. So the nozzles only change one of three things. Either they don't filter the treble, they filter it slightly, or they filter it slightly more. We actually have some graphs that have come out showing this, that um, you're not really adjusting the, the amount. These are not bass oriented, they just drop the treble a bit more. So all you can really control in these, unlike the other IMs, which actually have uh, nozzles that do you know, uh, change the actual shape of the output like you do with tips, they all these are doing is just changing the filtering of the treble so you're not really changing the sound at all and this is where things get a little bit interesting so before I talk about the sound specifically I'm going to go slightly backwards and talk about the tips or the pointlessness of them so do you remember what happened with the FA7s which were the multiple balance armature ones well we know that a, a regular kind of dynamic driver set up like this is very affected by the shape and, and, and makeup of, especially the output, the size out of the, of the tip. So if you have standard tips, these increase the base of the dynamic driver. And if you have wide bore tips like these spiral dots, well, they reduce the amount of base. So you can tune, uh, you can tune dynamic IMs and you can tune uh, hybrid IMs using this method. But because they use a more complex setup in here, where they have their own kind of tuning uh, set up for the, the, the bass driver doesn't just output straight through to this nozzle but goes through like a tube, changing the tips made pretty much no difference. Maybe a subtle difference, but essentially none. Uh, for, the, for all intents and purposes, it wasn't anything to... It wasn't like, oh, the vocal tips are going to bring forward the vocals and the bass tips are going to uh, reduce the treble and bring the bass. None of that happened. And it's weird, again, FIO have done a weird thing here, like they did with the FA7s, where they have this multi-tip selection, and most of it is pointless. I mean, you can just literally, that's all you need. And the standard medium tips are already on it. So literally half these tips are kind of pointless. Now the spin fits are, are useful because they are, now they're available in, in a, a wider bore size, are, are very comfortable. If you don't like IEMs, these are way more comfortable. But again, you know, you don't need these vocal tips and these bass tips. It's a complete waste of, complete pointless, completely pointless. They make no difference because these are more complex setup. So, and you don't get bass enhancement with the, the bass nozzles. All it does is, as I said, it cuts down the treble slightly. So all it is becomes is treble tuning. And that's where we get into the sound. Now, I stuck with the bass focused tips, as they call uh, nozzles, I should say, or the ones that reduce the amount of treble the most. And now I'll explain why. So this is where we get into the sound. Now the, the FH5 had a kind of very bass punchy, you know, had super, you know, super thumping bass. They did a good job of being very entertaining and very fun sounding with still very forward mids. These back up on the bass a bit, but still maintain a fairly similar sound signature. That tonality wise, we're just talking about a bit, instead of the kind of, I wouldn't call it overkill bass, I thought the amount of bass on this, even with a, you know, everything set up bass oriented, such as the tips, was still very kind of entertaining and fun, you know, great all rounders. These are great all rounders too, fairly similar sound signature, but kind of backs off the bass a bit. But the thing they do do really well is everything is much more refined. So all this, although you can't really tune it as much as it suggests you can with all the tips and the nozzles, what you, ca what you do get is much, much more refined bass. And you get more refined treble and you get more refined mid-range. And overall, that works out really well because, like I said, the sound improvement is like, the sound improvement is the equivalent to the improvement of these these this kind of wavy design versus the complexity of this kind of even more realistic wavy design that's on here 
if you want a visualization of improvement, it's the difference between the physical, the physical artwork on them. It's like that. And as listening goes, initially I found them to be a bit too bright in the treble, which is why I've gone for the, the, the least amount of treble, the, the nozzles with the least amount of treble. So now this is why I come back to what has this got to do with flagship headphones? And the thing is, recently I'd switched to the Meze Imperians as my main headphones, and kind of I found the Utopias a bit too bright, and before I hadn't, I'd found them about right. And I think much the same thing came with this. I was, I'd adapted myself to a slightly darker sound. So when I listened with these initially, I find them piercingly bright. And what was worse is that I put on this silver cable. Now, a good cable should make no difference to the sound other than maybe a slight improvement versus a cheap stock cable. If, uh, you know, the, the manufacturer has provided a kind of cheap and, and fairly basic cable. FIA doesn't provide cheap and fairly basic cables. They provide good cables. And I've said don't even bother upgrading them. They're fine. But these, this on there sounds really bright. Now, you can argue, argue to death about, you know, cables don't make a difference and all that. But something in the construction of cables and something in the design of them does change the sound in some way, which I don't understand. It's not frequency response. It's something else. I'm not going to get, try and even figure out how to go into detail about it. There are people who know about these things and they can talk about them if they want and you can ask cable makers and whatever about, about how, you, how, close, how tightly you weave the cable and how many strands and what thickness of the strands and the, the, the covering material and all that. But I'll leave that up to them. So my initial impressions were that these were piercingly bright even if they, everything else was fine. But now this recently I've been trying to listen to the Utopias again to kind of understand why, you know, if I can still enjoy them. And so I got used to that slightly brighter upper mid sound of the, of the Utopias and, and I came around to listening with these again. And the thing is, that, great, that jump up in refinement from the FH5 has made them a really great all-round listening IEM. Now, as I said, there's... Not, there's not a huge hump in the bass. I mean, if you look at the frequency response graphs, it seems fairly even and flat, but there's still quite a bass kick in there from that, that dynamic driver. And I think that's a specialty of dynamic drivers that they just do that well. And this, with the, uh, the setup they have in here, does excellent and quite detailed bass. It's very impressive to hear a lot of detail on the bass and, and very enjoyable. The mid-range has still got that... I still... I guess this is what people call a W sound, where you kind of have you know, big bass, and then a jump in the mids, and then jump in the treble. It's probably something like that still, although even if the bass is taken back a bit, there's still a very forward mid-range, and some people don't like, or didn't like, I should say, the FH5 forward mid-range. But what it does for me is it really enhances instruments. So, for example, there are a couple of tracks I was listening to recently. Uh, one was um, from Massive Attack called Live With Me, and it's kind of a fairly dull track. And another one which was from uh, Radiohead called Staircase, and both of uh, a more recent track, and both are fairly, they're kind of dull tracks if you listen in the car with, you know, regular stereo, but this brings out the mid-range of these tracks, I suppose, the FH5 to a degree, which in a way that it, it enhances and gives them more kind of contrast inside the track, which made it very enjoyable to listen to. But going through my usual list of tracks, I have a playlist, as you may know, called Number 82 Playlist. And Number 82 Playlist is uh, a series of tracks that ended up being a playlist of stuff I liked, but it also ended up uh, being one for testing because I became so familiar with it. Now, we're going through the uh, the black filter and the stock tips and the um, and maybe some, and some of the time I really listened as well with a red filter, and first up on that is uh, Jeff Beck with Goodbye Pork Pie Hat. And that's an old 1970s track with guitar. And, it's, and if it's done really well, you can really hear the instruments clearly out of a good system. Uh, it's a very full sound with strong bass, even though, as I said, it dropped down the bass compared to the FH5s. Not too far back. And it's kind of a really intense presentation with these. Really brings the, the, you know, the instruments forward. Uh, but there's still a really good sense of space and instrument delineation. So, you know, you really feel like there's an, there's an instrument here, there's an instrument here, the guitars are here, or, or something else is, you know, in the sound stage. Um, it's not as refined in the treble as high-end IEMs. Like, you get a good pair of $2,000 IEMs, 
you know, the treble is delicate and, and, and precise in a way that this can't do, but it's a jump up and refinement from the FH5. So the FH5s kind of sounded, you know, the treble was maybe a touch grainy, cymbals tended to kind of not have as much clarity, you know, things were kind of a little bit hazy, whereas the FH7 kind of cleans all that up. Again, it's like these waves on the top, the difference in kind of clarity. The FH5 was very much like this. The FH7 is very much, you can see some, you know, details in the curve here. If you notice that kind of level of difference, it's, it's like that. So, you know, the, the cymbal sounded better. And, of course, initially they sounded a bit too bright for me, especially with the silver cable. But now I've kind of come around to it and it's kind of sounds more balanced. Though, of course, your mileage may vary. And again, like I found out, depends what you're used to at any one point in time. The FH7 has, has mids that are, uh, uh, can say, compared to the Solaris, is it kind of warmer and fuller sounding, whereas, say, the uh, Campfire Audio Solaris is kind of flatter sounding and has, seems to have left depth. The thing that's great about the FH7s is they have amazing depth in the sound. And that's what made them really great to listen with. They kind of every they make everything sound exciting and bring out instruments and vocals and things and everything. So my second track is Hollow Talk Choir of Young Believers. And maybe the only thing that's missing from this track is a slight warble in the background of the music, which is audible with some headphones. But like every instrument, even with the vocals, presented really clearly. And maybe again, if I thought there's a little bit on the bright side for preference initially. The FH7 has a more airy presentation, you know, kind of highlighting the instruments, and the FH5 has kind of more body and depth going with the, you know, uh, bass-focused tips. So, you know, but of course the FH5 you can tune somewhat, but you can't get kind of the clarity you can out of the treble and mid-range that you can with the FH7. Good old Santana, the FA7 in comparison, which I listened to, yeah, all the instruments seem to take a step back and everything seems kind of more muffled. Like the F, F, FA7 is like everything's in a blob in the middle. And while they're kind of thick and warm sounding, you know, you switch to the FH7 and it's kind of everything's spaced out, everything's clearly delineated. Same with Angel from Massive Attack. And this is where the dynamic driver really kicks ass. I mean, it was a really kick ass track with the um, FH5s, you know, that thumping bass. And. Uh, you know, like the rumble of the bass in, in the track, you know, you hear more of the detail with the FH7. The only thing is, I get the feeling like the bass sometimes is overwhelming the internal, like the internal uh, chamber or the dr in driver with because there's a slight whoosh sound with each thump, and it sounds like it's overwhelming these. That's probably the only time I got them, you know, kind of found a fault with it, and it wasn't a bad thing, but it sounded like yeah, it sounded like it kind of hit its limit. And I don't think that was in the track because I haven't heard it in, uh, kind of whoosh in the headphones. But um, the FA7, which is the, the multi-balance armature IMs, kind of everything, again, everything is more of a blob, a less separation of the instruments. And whereas the FH7, this one, seems to separate out everything really well. So it doesn't just become about the bass, but about all the mid-range instrument and everything going on there. And it really makes uh, this kind of music very entertaining. Likewise, Sophie Tucker, um, you know, great entertaining percussion performance in there too. Great, very, very great fun. I mean, it's a very fun track, of course, with the FH5s. But this, you know, you you don't think like an electronic track would be more could be more entertaining with a higher end IM, but actually that can be. And I mean, things like stacks, electrostats, what we get used to, you know, are great for listening to things like Spongle with. Another one, uh, the new basement tapes, when I get my hands on you. I talked about that as a bass test for the deep, low rumble that it has at the beginning, or actually through the whole track. Um, the interesting thing was the FH7 delivered some real texture to that rumble, which was something special. Not just delivering the rumble, but actually hearing texture in it is a sound of, is usually something you get with higher end IMs. So another one, uh, Neil Young, old man. This is just purely vocal, so you don't really get uh, you know, the, this is where the bass doesn't become an issue. Uh, but it's really great how it was possible to make out the subtleties of the guitar playing, which is something I usually expect from higher end gear. And the FH7 gave this track, you know, a really pleasant amount of body while keeping all the instruments really delineated, like really separate. And you know, the kind of pleasant naturalness about how they were presented. So it sounded natural. Uh, my notes for the FA, FA7 which was, again, much the same kind of thing. Everything's less clear, more on a blob, 
uh, like FA7 was very relaxed to listen with, while the FH7 kind of pushes everything in your face. Um, Arlington by the Wailing Jennies. Again, this has a lot of percussion in there and low percussion too. Uh, really great with the vocals and guitars. The FH7, I had notes that it gave the ple this, this track a, a pleasant amount of body while keeping the instruments delineated. If anything, this track sounds a touch closed in compared to what I'm used to from some, some other IEMs and headphones. Actually, I thought that was the IEMs, but actually found out it's the track because I tried to switch back to headphones and I thought, actually, this does track itself. It's the track. And so I found that the FH7s were giving a very accurate presentation of the kind of space amount of space that's actually on the track rather than artificially smearing it wide as some headphones and IEMs might do and I found that really really commendable about the uh, sound again FA7s uh, you know give you the easy listen and it doesn't bring out the detail of percussion in any area from anywhere in the in the sound either low sounds high sounds the Solaris was an interesting comparison it doesn't give the vocals as much air as the FH7s, and usually with kind of live, rec live type recordings, the uh, Solaris is usually excellent. I found these to be kind of very much the Solaris is still very good with kind of live recordings, but whereas the, the Solaris is kind of more flat and even sound, this was more kind of super dynamic, where everything kind of really individually jumps out at you. And it was an interesting comparison, as I really do like the Solaris as, as you know, a preferred pair of IEMs, but in some respects, kind of the liveliness of these IEMs did a better job. Probably the only way, place I really found maybe, uh, you know, they don't have the treble of a super high-end IEM, like a $2,000 pair. But if you've never heard in a $2,000 pair of IEMs, you could buy the FH7s and be extremely pleased. So that my overall feeling about this, and you know, changing tips irregardless, because whatever I changed came up with much maybe subtle differences that probably aren't worth even talking about. Essentially, the overall sound is very much in your face, really super lively and entertaining sound, very detailed, way you know, I think above their price range, and you know, generally excellent, if not, you know, $2,000 IEM excellent. So I was very surprised that to end up with that impression, actually. And we, uh, I, it's, I, I can't say specifically they become my favorite IEMs, but they make everything else sound really dull and boring. Honestly, like someone said, what do they sound like compared to Andromeda's? And it's like, Andromeda's just sound really dull in comparison after listening with these, it just makes everything sound entertaining. Also, someone asked about the Polaris, and the Polaris, I feel sorry for the Polaris because it's come at the worst possible time. These are all kind of like boomy bass plus some bright treble and everything just smothered over by the bass. And, you know, all the instruments that I can hear in the FH7, I can't hear with the, the Polaris, which was really, really sad, actually, because, you know, if, they, if they'd been tuned a bit different, they could have, could have been better. The... Polaris was almost like a kind of dynamic driver version of the FA7s where it was just all like one blob of sound almost, whereas these are just sound much more like something that's high end. Listening with the FH7s wasn't all perfect, however. One example was Jazz at the Pawn Shop, which is a very famous jazz album and which is very I suppose close mic instruments and that the more the forward mid-range kind of push the instruments too far forward so for example there's a shaker going on in there and it's just it's like too in your face and uh, kind of sounds unnatural so in that thing um, uh, more expensive IEMs like the Solaris give a, uh, a better balance in that regard so again I, whereas a lot of music I did like the presentation with these some music which was already kind of very uh, everything was very close up in its uh, in the recording kind of sounded uh, a bit too unnatural with them the other thing i don't like is this uh the memory it's not memory wire it's kind of uh it's obviously maybe some kind of plastic that uh, ret retains its shape on the fa7s i actually cut this off this outer plastic sheath off which you know, if you can see it doesn't have the big lump like the on the uh cable of say the fh5s and other things so for example the fh5 has this big lumpy thing at the end of the uh, the moldable plastic. I guess you could heat it up with a hairdryer and, and change the shape, but it was just found it irritating. But at least this one is probably easier to uh, trim down or cut off if uh, you find it troublesome. But it, is, it does if you wrap up the head earphones and they get tangled very fast if you have this, you know, hooking in the uh, IMs hooking into each other and then 
that was kind of the only really downside to it. And the cable itself is maybe a little bit thicker than average than some other IEMs. But overall, you know, I thought the FH7s did a really fantastic job of giving you almost high-end kind of sound. And the detail level, of course, was actually, I suppose, into the high-end, really. Uh, maybe you could, maybe there are some IEMs out there that extract more. Maybe I'll find some that do. But all the same, I mean, for under five hundred dollars, these are kind of a really a really great buy, and and for the most part, are really well made. So, you know, I think Afia did a really fantastic job, and I hope my uh, video has given you an impression of how they sound. Thanks once again for watching. If you did like my videos, do consider becoming a patron for as little as uh, the equivalent of buying me a coffee once in a while. You can see my videos in advance without ads. And you can get to be in the draw for some free stuff too, as well as joining our little community of uh, audio enthusiasts. So thanks once again for watching and I'll see you online.